with self-restraint and self-care. I want to dig into some of the conversations that have already been seated. It's hard for me to switch gears <laughs> to think about my own presentation. And so for those of you who are on the call with us, if you're feeling the same thing, I, I appreciate your regulation and, and shifting gears yet one more time. Um, today, what I'd like to talk about are the neurobiological mechanisms of coaching. And uh, like Melvin's conundrum between a ten TED talk or a traditional academic talk, I was having somewhat that same debate. And I think perhaps I fell a little more toward the technical side than did Melvin. So, so refill your coffee if you need to. Uh, here we go. So as we look, or at least as I looked at the coaching literature, a, a good deal of existing research has begun to examine the mechanisms of coaching. The mechanisms are the, the factors that tell us something about how desired outcomes of coaching are achieved. And predominantly, these factors that exist in the literature are psychological in nature. They're about need fulfillment, self-efficacy, psych psychological capital, emotional intelligence, mindfulness, I'm sure there are others, um, but they are really only the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And underneath the surface exists this sort of sea of opportunity to really dig more deeply into what enables coaching processes to, to help people change and, and transform. And so one way of, of digging below the surface is to use neuroscience or psychophysiolo psychophysiology to help to explore what the body can tell us about how positive change and transformation occur. So from our work, you know, at a high level, we know that coaching conversations are moving to people and that these conversations elicit a neurobiological response in the coachee. Those responses influence their emotion, cognition, motivation, behavior, and some of those things and also influence the way they respond neurobiologically. Um, we don't know as much empirically about the neurobiology of the coach and the dyad, but we do know that in order for coaches to be effective, they have to understand these implicit and often hidden dynamics to do their best work. Much of the existing empirical work that examine neurobiological mechanisms is anchored to intentional change theory, which you heard Melvin talk about uh, in the first presentation. And so for my talk, I'd like to drill down more deeply into just the principle of emotional attractors. And you might notice a little bit of divergence from my thinking and Melvin's thinking on this. He mentioned the idea that there's this dichotomy set up of one is good, one is evil. In my view, this is not how emotional attractors work. Instead, they they work in tandem, not necessarily in perfect balance, because I think you do need more experiences of PEA than NEA to experience this sustained positive change. But let me tell you a little bit more about uh, emotional attractors. Refresh your mind, your memory. The idea of principle, the idea of emotional attractors, is that these are psychophysiological states around which learning behavior is organized. And they stimulate movement through the process of intentional change. Both are necessary. We need experiences of the NEA at certain times in the process to help us focus, to help us make decisions, to help us set goals. But there are times when those can be maladaptive. And then there are times when being in the PEA can be maladaptive. Um, so it, it, with these two little circles, of, the way I think about the PEA is that being in the PEA state, the positive emotional attractor state, we're enabling clients to aspire, to grow, and to thrive. And when our clients are in the NEA state or our coachees, that state helps them to or forces them to evaluate, to protect, and to survive. Melvin talked about this to some degree, so I'm not gonna go into to a lot of detail, but suffice it to say that these two types of attractors, positive and emotional, negative, positive emotional attractors and negative emotional attractors are associated with every aspect, 
every discovery in the intentional change process. And they tend to be quite pronounced in ideal self and real self discovery phases. So ideal self conversations help a person explore who they wanna be, what they want to do in, in the future. And that activates this PEA state. Whereas the real self tends to sometimes, especially when the coach is not highly adept, um, it tends to focus on weaknesses. You know, how do I shore up weaknesses? 360 evaluation, goal setting, problem solving. And these activities activate the NEA state. So in most of the studies that I'll review and share today, these states have been experimentally induced by um, coaches who operating as part of our research team um, were told to focus either on the ideal self or the real self in their conversations with the participant based on random assignment. So what I'd like to do next is just share some of the common findings across a set of about four different studies uh, that also of course draw on uh, you know, a non-direct studies of coaching to inform some of the hypotheses. But these are four empirical studies that have been produced um, by myself and colleagues affiliated with the Coaching Research Lab at Case Western Reserve University. So probably the most robust finding across all of the studies is that the emotion uh, is true to the PEA and NEA is true to its name. You know, the, the PEA is emotionally up, uplifting, the NEA is somewhat mood dampening, and this has been found again and again. Uh, based on pre and post self-report measures, participants felt you know, better leaving a conversation around the ideal self that was meant to evoke the PEA than they did walking into it. And uh, participants felt less <laughs> uplifted, uh, felt worse after the NEA than they did before it. But I need to say that even in the NEA condition, participants overall affect was more positive than negative. Um, in another study, linguistic analysis of transcriptions of coaching sessions, um, showed that people in the NEA condition use more negative words. So that's consistent with that's the same finding of pre and post measures. And, but in it, this study of, of the whole transcript also pointed to a much more sort of nuanced uh, picture of fluctuations in emotional expression across the coaching session. So that could be a place where we do more um, research. And finally, uh, the PEA in some of our fMRI studies, the PEA condition was associated with activations of, activation of brain areas that are associated with processing positive em emotions. So uh, we can you know, say fairly confidently that emotions are a differentiator between these two states. Now, looking at some of our fMRI studies are, you know, examining neuroimaging data or brain activity suggests that there are a number of other mechanisms at play. One of which is the activation of broad neural networks responsible for empathic and analytic reasoning. And, and Melvin also alluded to these. So to be specific, the PEA is associated with activation of the empathic or default mode network, um, which when the default mode network is activated, we have a mental frame that supports cognitive and emotional openness, social connectedness, and a, a sense of being connected to our morals and our values. On the other hand, the NEA is associated with activation of the analytic or task positive network, which inhibits empathic reasoning. And it, it focuses us on evaluation, logic, and task accomplishment. So ultimately, this, this line of research suggests that the coaching process can influence the coachee's frame of reasoning anchored to their, their neural architecture, um, which certainly is a mechanism that would have impact on coaching outcomes. Another mechanism that arose from our um, study of brain activity um, is visual attention. So whether we're seeing the forest or the trees. So across two fMRI studies, we found an overlap 
between how the participant attended the statements from their coach who would coach them either in a PEA or NEA uh, condition and visual processing. So both the PEA and global attention tasks in these studies activated the visual associative areas. This is the part of the brain where we dream, where we put together the gestalt of an image, even if we don't have all the component parts. It's where we see the forest. There was also extensive overlap between the NEA coaching condition and local attention in the early visual areas that you see here in blue. <laughs> You probably can't see me pointing to them on my screen. <laughs> you see here in blue. Um, and this is the part of the brain where we detect features and we see fine details, like seeing the trees. So again, this line of research suggests another neurobiological mechanism is how global and local attention can affect what coaches see in their mind's eye and what possibilities are available to them, whether they're focused on the forest or focused on the trees. And so a final place that we've looked uh, to understand the neurobiological mechanisms of coaching is the autonomic nervous system. And uh, myself and another colleague separately uh, conducted studies where we used indirect measures of brain activity that tap into sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system activation. Um, and with some conflicting results, I suppose. So theoretically, uh, the PEA should be associated with greater influence of the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the part of your nervous system that helps you rest and digest and recover from episodes of stress. The NEA would then be associated with greater influence of the sympathetic nervous system, which as Melvin described, that's your flight or fight or flight response that sends blood to your extremities and your muscles. So you prepare to respond to a threatening situation. Um, in both of the studies, there was no, there were no significant differences in any of the measures that we used: salivary cortisol, galvanic skin response, heart rate variability during the coaching session. And so separately, we, we both theorized that this is, could be due to just the social demands of interacting with another person. They're physiologically activating. So they may not be sort of emotionally stressful, but from a bodily perspective, the stress response that we could be seeing. And of course, it could be a measurement error. We're, we're taking these measurements at the wrong time too. However, um, one of the studies looked at um, some of those measures in goal setting later. So after, the, after a coaching conversation ended, a, a client was engaged in sort of doing some of their own writing of goals. And there we saw the PE, the parasympathetic um, nervous, ben, uh, nervous system benefits accrue for those who are in the PEA condition, but not those who are in the NEA condition. So there, there's some indication that, that maybe these autonomic nervous system effects, particularly in terms of the parasympathetic nervous system, um, are beneficial a little bit after the coaching conversation ends. So we need a, more research in this area to really speak with confidence to what's going on from an autonomic perspective. So in summary, what I think the neurobiological mechanisms point to are a set of um, a set of mechanisms that are under the surface that underlie some of those psychological mechanisms that I presented at the beginning. And those these are emotions, empathic versus analytic reasoning, visual attention, and processes related to stress arousal and renewal. In terms of future research. I think there are opportunities specific to intentional change theory to really tease out the role of temporal construal. So how important is it that people are thinking about the future versus thinking about the present or the past? And what effect does that have on what the client's resources are for change? Um, I also think we need to embrace the complexity of these phenomenon that we are highly complex individuals. We're never in just one state or the other, although the analytic and empathetic networks are uh, suppress one another. So in some ways you could say we're in one state or the other, but for such a small period of time. So I think future research really needs to embrace the complex nature of these phenomenon in the body and figure out you know, how do we look at toggling between states, recovery processes, and how does that 
apply to what we do inside the coaching session and what clients might do beyond the coaching session. And then of course, we need to replicate and extend the work that we've already done and especially pay attention to what's happening for the coach, what's happening for the dyad, perhaps the coherence between the two, and also what's happening in other coaching configurations like peer coaching, team coaching, group coaching, because all of this work has been focused on sort of a traditional one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching configuration. I think coaching future research more generally needs to think about applying a neurobiological lens to some of the topics that are important <laughs> in coaching today. So thinking about how does this apply to coaching supervision? How does this apply to dynamics related to diversity, equity, inclusion? What can a neurobiological perspective tell us about dealing with burnout and post-traumatic growth in coaching? This one I think is import particularly important. How do we take a neurobiological perspective on AI coaching when a human isn't involved on one end <laughs> with bots and apps? And how do we use it to explore ethical dimensions in coaching? So I think all of those are important to think about as we, th as we look to sort of the next generation of research on this. Um, I also think it's, it would be interesting to examine the impact of health behaviors like nutrition, hydration, sleep, exercise as either antecedents or moderators of some of these dynamics. And then um, of course there are coaching practices already that, that specifically address clients' neurobiology, practices like breath work, heart math, body scan, somatic coaching in general. And so these practices may be a place to delve into more broad understanding of these neurobiological mechanisms at play. So with that, I will conclude and move us toward conversation.